So Nahum chapter number one. We'll begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. And the mountains quake at him, the hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury pours out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And we'll stop there for a minute. In this passage, Nahum, prophet of God, gets a vision from the Lord. It is the burden of Nineveh. It is the burden that God gave him for God's people. Okay, now keep in mind, Nineveh. Same place that Jonah was sent to. Same place, great revival took place. You study it out, everybody, even the animals got right with God. That's how strong revival showed up in Nineveh. From the king all the way down to the lowest of the low, everybody turned towards God, repented, and got right with him. That's a great thing. And you can study it out. It's, it's not that long between Jonah and when the book of Nahum was written. Isn't that far of a distance? America's been around longer than the time that passed in between those two books. Right When you look at the grand scheme of things since Adam, it was just a grain on the seashore compared to all of eternity between Jonah, the book of Jonah, and the book of Nahum. So what are you saying? Things can change really quickly. The message that Nahum delivers to Nineveh, it's almost as if the people in that city forgot God. It's almost as if they had ever forgotten that a man named Jonah showed up. And you say, well, Brother Jordan... We're here today. We know that God still exists. I, said, I understand that. But collectively as a nation, it's almost as if America's forgotten that God exists. Some Christians that show up every Sunday, they leave Jesus out. It's almost as if that they forgot that Jesus saved them. It's just ritual. It's just habit. I mean, we've heard it taught on the past couple of weeks from our pastor that some people were all excited about coming back to the building, but they weren't excited about coming to worship. What good is a building if you don't use it for the reason that God gave it to you to use? What good is a man of God if nobody listens? What good is an altar if nobody ever comes to it and prays? That's what Nineveh had gotten into the place where it was almost as if they forgot that God ever had mercy on them, ever showed them a situation where, I mean, the first time he told them, going to be destroyed or you're going to repent. Thankfully, they repented. But, well, why is it the burden of Nineveh? Why is it the, the burden of those? Because it wasn't just Nineveh. Nineveh, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, all of Israel had gotten to the point where Nineveh was the first, part, the first time. But they were so wicked that God had purposed that if they weren't going to live the way that God told them to, God was going to let all of them lose everything that they dearly loved. Keep in mind, not that far after this, Israel goes out, and they're not in captivity anymore. They're conquered. Okay, I mean, here, look with me in verse number yeah, 9. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. If you study out the Old Testament, God's people, Israel, after he changed Jacob's name from Israel, his 12 sons, they went into Egypt in a time of a famine. And Joseph had been made second in command to all of Egypt. He had been warned of the famine by God. He had saved up stores. And Israel dwelled in the land of Egypt for a very long time. They became a great nation. Egypt forgot Joseph and how God had used Joseph, 
and turned them into slaves. Took away all that the former Pharaoh had given to them and put them in affliction. Why? Because while Israel was in Egypt, Israel forgot God. And then, after some 400 years or so, they turned back towards God because of the affliction that God had delivered on them. And then God restored them, and then after 40 years in the wilderness, because some of them were still so stubborn that they wouldn't turn, turn towards God. After that lot had died off and a generation had passed into the wilderness, then the promised land was delivered and God made them a nation. Okay, very significant. Before that, all of Israel had been wonders. They were like Abraham. They were looking for the city whose builder and maker was God. God had promised it to Abraham, but because God's people forgot God, he couldn't deliver it to them. Well, at this point in time, they have their own nation. They are not a wandering people. They are God's people in God's nation. And God's saying, affliction's not going to come. I'm not going to turn you into slaves again. I'm not going to let you be delivered into another country. He's saying, I'm going to wipe the whole nation off of the map. And until 1948, there was no nation of Israel. From the time that these people did not hearken unto God, until 1948, there was no independent sovereign nation known as Israel. There was Palestine, because they took over at some point, and they carved that point out, and they said, well, this is Palestine. And then, after World War II, some of them said, yeah, but it wasn't always. And they gave back a portion, not all of it. If they'd have given everything that God promised back to them, half of the Middle East would be a, one nation called Israel right now. It's is, is a big swath of land. Right? But they gave them back a small part, and then they became a nation again. Well, in verse number 9, God said, Affliction's not coming this time. Destruction's coming this time. God destroyed it. God said, it's not going to be a time where I take back what I've given. He says, I'm going to remove it altogether. Even once it was restored, it was a fraction of what they could have had the entire time. Why? Because people forgot God. So, let's go back to verse number 2. God is jealous, the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserveth wrath for his enemies. We see two groups of people. Adversaries and enemies. Two different words because God meant two different things. They are not the same. An enemy is someone that is opposed to you. They stand for everything that you do not stand for. They fight against you. There is an activeness to an enemy. An enemy does not sit idly by and let you do whatever you want to do. An enemy is always trying to stop you. I almost said anemone like I'm in Nemo. Anyway, some of y'all got that. Others, don't worry about it. Well, what's an adversary? An adversary doesn't necessarily hate you, doesn't necessarily care about you, may not even know that you exist. But an adversary pulls against you, makes your life harder. Aside from Sister Billy, I don't know anybody that works at the IRS, but sometimes the IRS is my adversary because they say taxes. And I say, yeah, but I really wish I didn't have to pay them. I'd really like to buy another lightsaber, which I'm not going to do. But right, crude illustration, but the nail that's in the middle of the road that I drive over and flattens my tire, didn't know that I existed. But yet, it can be an adversary to it, because it's keeping me from going where I want to go. Now i got to change the tire. An adversary may not fight against you, but they do slow you down. They weigh you down. They pull against what it is that you are trying to do. Now, in the eyes of God, those that are the enemies of God are those that are actively trying to squash the people of God, the church of God, the movement of God, trying to change the word of God, trying to prevent people from hearing the truth of God. I dare say that there's very few of those that are saved and on their way to heaven. But there may be many adversaries, blood-washed, born again, sealed with the Holy Spirit, on their way to heaven, 
but they're pulling against what God wants. What did God say that he would do to his adversaries? Verse number two, he takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's why we ought not judge. That's all in God's hands. But I can judge according to what God tells me to judge, whether it be good or evil, whether I should do it or whether I should not do it. But when it comes to repaying evil, that's not my job. I'm supposed to be loving. I'm supposed to have compassion. I'm supposed to be long-suffering. I'm supposed to leave vengeance to the Lord so that I can focus upon being the Christian that I ought to be. But see, God's going to take vengeance upon his adversaries. Israel, though they were God's chosen people, though they lived in the place that God gave them, though they had everything that they you know, required to live righteously before the Lord, they became the adversary of God. You want to know why? Well, let's, let's continue reading after verse number 9. I've got to turn the page. Hang on a second. Look at verse number 13. For now I will break this yoke off from thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Talking to God's people, he's saying, I'm going to cut your name and your seed off because you've turned to the house of the lowercase g, gods. Molten images, graven images, they had turned from worshiping the Almighty and instead started worshiping the creation rather than the Creator. And don't look down on these people. Those that came down to Egypt tried to do it just within a couple of days or a couple of hours of seeing that God in a pillar of fire kept Pharaoh's army from getting to him while a strong wind was blowing so hard that it parted the Red Sea, dried the ground, and made it to where it was solid. They walked across it, then God drowned Pharaoh and all of his army behind him. You know why? Because they got scared. They saw the lightning and the thunder on top of the mountain while Moses was up there receiving the law, and they said, hey, that, that God talks so loud that it shakes the earth. His very presence is a storm upon the top of the mountain. We don't want anything to do with him. That God scares us. We can't control him. We can't decide what that God wants us to do. At least they had enough sense to realize you can't argue with God. So they decided that they would just ignore God came to Aaron and took their earrings out of their ear, which marked them as slaves, broke them off, and said, take the thing that used to keep us in bondage, mark this as a servant, a slave, and make us something that we will become a servant to ourselves. They were going to make themselves a slave to a false religion with the very jewelry that God, you know, had orchestrated, marked them as a slave. Instead of breaking it off and walking into the freedom of God, they broke it off and tried to make themselves a slave again. What did God tell them in verse number 14? Thou art vile. This isn't that Laodicean church that they're not cold nor hot. These are the ones that have walked away from God completely. If God said he would spew Laodicea out of his mouth, how much more those that worship false gods? But what's the comparison? Well, today, after a month of, for lack of a better term, captivity, where we were not openly allowed to come out collectively as a people of God and fulfill the ordinances of God and follow after God the way that we wanted to, God says there will not be another affliction. It's either get all in or the next time, it's going to be permanent. You say, well, how, Brother Jordan? You cannot see what just happened and not see it as a test run for the Antichrist. You know how many people that used to say, well, I'll stay, I'd never, and they fell in line and they started goose-stepping right behind the guy that was taking away their liberties? That all started back with the Patriot Act anyway. That's why people hated Jesse Snowden, or whatever his name was. Yeah, somebody Snowden. Because he whistle blew on the NSA. He said, no, 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 the NSA is not just looking for terrorists. They're taking all the photos on your cell phone. They've got a database of every text message that you ever sent. 
the next thing that they were going to implement, and they still might, there's going to be AI software and security cameras that note whether people are congregating too close together. Then with facial recognition software, they'll mark you. And if you're not wearing a mask, you may receive a fine in the mail. You say, well, that would never happen. It's already in the pipeline. They've already got it in beta testing. It's only by the grace of God that it won't be in effect. What is all of that? Getting us to the point, well, if you don't have a mask on, you can't go in. If you're standing too close together, you're not allowed to be here. It's not a hop, skip, and a jump. It is a very small step to say, well, if you don't have this sign in your right hand or in your forehead, you can't come in. If you don't have a certain RFID chip in your hand, or if you don't have a certain barcode in your forehead, you can't walk in. You can't pay. You can't be a part of us. And they've already shown the mask don't stop you from getting it. It stops you from giving it to somebody else if you already had it which I think we all did back in either November or February. But anyway, what was it? It was just a little bit of some of those things that we wrestle against. We wrestle not against flesh and the blood, but maybe some against some of them principalities or the powers or that spiritual wickedness in high places or the rulers of darkness. Just flexing a little bit, saying, Can we, are we ready to do this? It's only the grace of God that it didn't go further. But it was a wake-up call. Some that was just coasting. Some that, I'll just say, I know people that take off work, put in their vacation time to stay home and watch March Madness every year. Then people put in vacation time on January 1st, Brother Josh, just to sit around the house and do nothing. I find that a little ironic. But if people are willing to go there, I know people that if certain teams are playing certain sporting events, they don't show up at church. You're telling me that's not a graven image or a molten image? I know certain people that if family reunions are going on, they're not in church. Did not Jesus say, if you're the father or mother more than me, son or daughter, you're not worthy of me? But that, that's an adversary. People that if they just aren't feeling 100%, what morning do you wake up and feel 100%? I don't know what 100% feels like anymore. Even if I get a good night's you know, sleep, I wake up, and for some odd reason, probably this morning, I wake up, I slept well last night, brother, got a headache, I'm blaming it on allergies. You know why I'm blaming it on it? Because I woke up this morning, my eyes felt like they had sandpaper on the other side of them. But what, it also just could be, you know, the flesh not wanting to go to church today, knowing that, you know, we was going to be assembled. I don't know what it was, but I didn't feel 100%. Very few days I'd say I feel like I'm at 50%. Okay? But those that just say, well, I just, I just don't feel. Well, how do you think the Apostle Paul felt after he'd been beaten to within an inch of his life? Then they find out that, oh, hang on a second. This is God's man. They try to kill him, but God always make a way for him to get out. How do you think he and Silas felt when they were in that inner prison, the vile, disgusting place where they threw all the refuse and the waste in the hopes that those people would get infections in their cuts and sores so that they die before they had to put them on trial? You ever had a cut? You know how bad it cuts things when you put something on there to clean it? Imagine how bad that cut would feel if you put it in the most vile substance you can think of. I guarantee you that there were rodents in there chewing on them. I guarantee you that there were leeches or something trying to suck the very blood out of them. And in that state, they still had the presence of mind to pray and sing praises unto God. Some of us would confess to things that we didn't even do just to get out of the inner prison. Some of us would give up and say, take whatever you want, just get me out of here. You want to know how I know that? Because for a month, churches were shut down. People didn't stand up for it. People didn't look at the person that got elected because he promised to do things that he already can't do. Don't get me on that, Joker. Anyway. It's got on the governor's page that he was, he was instilled with the values of his grandfather who was a, a Baptist preacher. Obviously, his, 
One of two things happened. His grandfather didn't teach the right thing, or he was instilled with it, but he, did, he just rejected it because he kept abortion clinics open. He and his father both, friends of the gambling and the alcohol industry. They explained to me why Christian's office over at the Sheriff's Department kept getting 911 calls for domestic violence because people were sitting at home, had more money than they usually made working a regular job, and went out and blew it because the liquor stores were open, and then they started beating on each other because they had nowhere else to go. You're telling me that a righteous person would say, well, yeah, I'm okay with people getting drunk and beating up their family members. Man's a hypocrite. And he was irrelevant until he declared emergency power. What are you saying? All those that rolled over, I'm talking about people, I'm talking as the U.S. Those that, you all know that in Tennessee, they didn't shut anything down? I'm moving to Tennessee, man. That governor said, you know what? Hair salons can stay open. People on the border between Kentucky and Tennessee were just going across the border and getting everything they needed and then coming back home. That's why the governor said, can't travel between states. You might bring it back. <laughs> why? Because one person saw, oh, they're going to see through the veneer, the facade. And he said, no, can't travel. Watch me. Because there's nothing that they could really do. It was scare tactics. But yet so many people rolled over. So many people that said, well, I'll stay in the line. There was a lot of people left to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, and the hedge was pretty broken. Am I saying that God's incapable? No. I'm just saying that the, uh, the front line looked a whole lot of, you know, gap-toothed. Those that said they'd be there weren't there. And by even inaction, we make ourselves the adversary of God. We either press toward the high calling of the mark of Jesus Christ, or we are in the way. Not an enemy, but an adversary. People have to carry the load that you dropped. The ones that you were supposed to go and tell, God has to get somebody else to go and tell them. And the fewer and fewer there are, God can do anything. But if those that are not obedient to do what God told them to do, they're the ones that are going to be held responsible. Vengeance upon his adversaries. So that's what we're going to teach on this morning, being an adversary of God. An adversary. We've already talked about one of the things that God outlined. Those that turn from worshiping God, worshiping things. Doesn't have to be a molten image, doesn't have to be a graven image just has to be anything that if it comes up, you'd put everything that you say you love everything that you claim to be all in for, well that's second now, that's not all in that's not having the love of God because the love of God put you first even over his very son an adversary is one that says well, if it's inconvenient I'm not going to stop you, but I'm not going to get out of the way. I'm going to do what I want. You know what God thought about that? He said, I'm going to take away everything that I once gave you. Israel still exists. They were still God's people. Daniel still opened his windows every day and prayed, but he had no temple. He had no priest. He had no place where he could go and at that time read the Word of God. All he had was what he put into his heart. If today they showed up and tried to take away all the copies of the Word of God, if your Bible was no longer with you, how much of it would you be able to go back and remember? An adversary is somebody that says, well, yeah, you can use that Bible, but I'm not going to stand up for it. I don't care what you preach out of. I'm just here to see people. I don't care what you teach me as long as I get to show up and Take part. You say, well, that'll never happen. Happened in Israel's day. It's happened a lot across this country. You want to know why some people didn't care whether or not they got to go to church? Because they realized a long time ago, whether they go or whether they don't, it doesn't change nothing for them. 
They're either still miserable, they're either still left with questions, all they do is they go up and they have somebody tell them something. Some places they get a little bit of a snack and a little bit of alcohol. Maybe that's why they go. But the point is, most people, they leave out the same. And they realize sitting at home over the past couple of weeks, it really isn't all that different sitting at home. It, it just felt the same. Well, it's because what they got isn't the same spirit that shows up around here. An adversary says, well, I don't care what happens. I just, I just want to go. I want to check something off of my list this week so I can lay my head down on my pillow and convince myself that I was holy this week because I went to church. Some people check off, well, I read the Bible. The Bible doesn't say read the Word of God. It says hide the Word of God into your heart. Study it. Study to show thyself approved, not to man, but to God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There are a lot of people that have convinced themselves that they have no shame until God shows up on the scene. What did Adam and Eve do? As soon as God showed up, they realized they was naked and they hid themselves. They had no shame until God showed up. Then they were shameful. You want to know why Israel had a whole bunch of shame? Because they had forgotten what God had told them, just like Adam and Eve. Or they remembered it and still did it anyway. They became adversaries. Those that hear and do not, to, know that, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him and to sin. Sin is the enemy of God. Those that are okay with sin are at the very least an adversary of God. But if you are blood washed, born again, and you go out and live with unrepentant sin in your life and unabashedly don't care about who sees it, you are the enemy of God at that point. We didn't talk about what God would do to his enemies. Verse number two, reserve his wrath for his enemies. I don't want to stand before the wrath of God. God's very presence is a consuming fire. You'll find that in Deuteronomy and in the book of Hebrews. You know what that means? You get closer to God, God's going to burn away them things that don't matter in your life and you're going to be okay with letting them go. You cannot get closer to God without losing more of who you used to be. You can't get closer to God without losing more of the flesh. You can't get to God without letting go of them things that hinder you from being who God wants you to be. That song that Sister Veronica sings, just thought of it. I don't want anything here to hinder me. What's that? The closer I get, the more I want God. God's just going to consume those things. Well, if His very presence is a consuming fire, imagine how much more consuming His wrath is. Go over to that map and show me where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. Can't do it. Because the wrath of God was poured out and left no trace. And it wasn't the true wrath of God. In His mercy, He didn't pour out His wrath on the whole earth. In His mercy, He could have said, not a flood, but fire, brimstone. If his very presence is a consuming... Imagine if God just revealed himself to the sin-cursed world. I mean, look, we already read it. Wait, that's the wrong chapter. I'm over in a back act now. Verse number 5. The mountains quake at him, the hills melt at him, the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. His very presence, not just the mountains, not just the hills, the very earth itself burns at his presence. People used to understand that and said, because, you know why it burns? You know why it changes? Because he's holy. Because he is altogether perfect. Because he made the world in perfection and since sin cursed it, embedded it, infected it, took root in everything about it, the earth can't stand before God anymore because it is imperfect. Here on earth, you take something that's pure and you put one drop of something in it. I mean, you've seen, I've seen Brother Peter do one of these object lessons over in the fellowship hall, or set up to do it. I didn't see him do it. But you can put just a little bit of food coloring into a glass of pure water, but the whole thing's a little bit different. May not be able to tell, but it's not what it used to be. That's how our mind works. 
But God in His holiness, His perfection, it erases all imperfection. It cannot stand before Him. Because He's the one that put it together. The creation has no power over the Creator. People used to know that. And they lived according to what God said. But those that are adversaries pick and choose what they can and cannot do. I can't give you chapter and verse on this, but I believe that a lot of them people in Nahum's day were a lot like them Pharisees in Jesus' day. Where they said, because we dress right, because we talk right, because we give so much money, because we get up and we teach and we proclaim what thus saith the Lord, we are what God wants us to be. And then they could justify the way that they lived the rest of their lives. They broke every law in the book to try Jesus at night and then crucify him. They hired false witnesses. None of them could agree anyway. All of what the Pharisees did, it was a whited sepulcher. It was a cistern that held no water. Had the appearance of holiness, but there was no holiness. Those are the adversaries of God. They say, they say they do a little, but with the rest of what they do, they try to prevent the things of God from getting... Because those people know if God really showed up, they'd have to get right. Now, I'm human. I've had this thought. You ever been sitting in a pew and that part of the flesh come up and say, ah, you can ignore what that preacher said. Or invitation comes and that part of the flesh says, nah, you, you know what, you're fine, you don't have to go to the altar. You're good just the way you are. You know what that is? That's the part of you that's the adversary of God. How do we overcome that? Through the Word. Through leaning on the Spirit. Through strengthening our spirituality. In fact, Ms. Sheila put up on a sign at work this week, one that said, spirituality without humility is toxic. Don't know where that came from, but that's good. You trying to be spiritual, if you don't have humility, your spirituality doesn't help other people. It infects them, like the Pharisees. The Pharisees made people twofold the child of hell because they weren't looking to God, they were looking to the Pharisees. I mean, you don't want to see what God said he would do to those that rose up and had false doctrine against them in this chapter. We don't have time to get into that. But see, we're talking to God's people. It's not an enemy that's rising up and teaching something. It's just those that are in the way. And God's saying, either get in the way, the bright and shining way, as the song says, get in the glory lane way, or get run over. Because he said in verse number 7, The Lord is good in a strong olden day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. You know why he's saying that? He's saying, those of you that are still doing right, I'll preserve you. I'll be a stronghold for you. But everybody else is getting wiped off the map. God always had a remnant because he knows those that trust in him, but he also knows that don't knows those that don't trust in him. Those that say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Those that when they once in a blue moon have the thought, well, maybe I should read the Bible, they say, yeah, but let's see if there's something else on TV. I'm convinced that people, if you just took the time that people channel surf and go through the guide trying to find, or go through Netflix trying to find something to watch, just take that time and get in the Word of God and see how much your life will be different. Spend that time talking to God. Spend that time going out and telling others, hey, there's something better. Because right now there's a whole bunch of people out there miserable. There's a whole bunch of people out there that they may be able to go back on the job, but they're still miserable. They got to get their forehead scanned every day. They got to wear the stupid mask. They got to put gloves on and everything else. How do you know that? Because I'm one of them and I hate it. And I take my gloves off every day and I feel like my hands are made out of sandpaper. It's weird. I don't know what it is. I don't like it. Somebody said, we have to have a COVID plan. And I put together about two paragraphs that said, Andy Bashir is an idiot and a tyrannical leader, and I don't agree with anything that he says, but I have to do it because I can't make a living if I don't. That was our COVID plan. But why are you saying that? Some people, it doesn't bother them. 
They're sheep, but they're not sheep for the Lord. They're sheep to just follow anything. They're sheep that by following something else are now in the way of what God wants to do. And he's saying, either get in line. Jesus said this way, man cannot serve two masters, you love one and hate the other. Cannot serve God and mammon. What's that mean? If you're not all in, you're all out. And if you're all out, you're an adversary at the very least. Some might be enemies. Some have taught that we must follow what the government does. Doesn't the Bible say that we're supposed to keep the laws and the ordinances? Yeah, unless they go against the things of God. What do you do with those that stood for God? What about Jeremiah? In his day, they beat him and commanded him not to. He did it anyway. What about Paul and Silas? They said, no, 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 what you're doing is against what we're going to do. So we're going to beat you and through the law command you to stop doing it. But well, the person in authority, God put that person in authority. Yeah, maybe so that if we lived righteously, God could make an example out of that person. Adversaries are those in action is still action. You're in the way. Going the wrong direction, certainly not helping nothing. But God's saying, next time it may be the tribulation period. We may be out of here. And yeah, I'm glad that someday I get to go, Brother Ray, but if that happens, there's a whole bunch of people left on this earth without hope. There's a whole bunch of people that have heard the gospel whose minds and their consciences will be seared and they will die and go to hell, spend all of eternity in the lake of fire. God doesn't want them to. So God sent us a little wake-up call that said, get in the way, but help plow. Head the right direction. Be a light. Salt the earth. Do what God told us to do so that God can do what He wishes to do. Because people sitting at home and having live, ter or live stream services, to my knowledge, didn't help anybody out in that community. How do you advertise a live stream service to people that have never been to church before? How do you get sinners to tune in to a live stream service? How do you get those that are back, those that are wayward on God, how do you reach those that have been left in the highways and the byways if you can't go out to the highways and byways? The masters opened up his feast and said, any that will. But if the servants can't go out and say, well, here's the feast. Well, you can have a feast, but it's, it's digital and you have to tune in and you have to have internet connection. If you don't have that, you're out of luck. That's, I don't believe that's the will of God. Because God uses people. God uses preaching. And this message, God saying, either get prepared or he may take us out of here. If the rapture don't happen, he may stamp Ichabod on the door. I don't want that to happen. I love this place, not because it's a place, but because of whose place this is, his. But if he stamped Ichabod on the door, I'd go wherever he told me to go. Some people would be okay, and they'd just keep coming and coming and coming. And you say, well, how'd that happen? I mean, why do you say that? Because I saw it in the old building. When we first came, when they didn't have Sunday school for years because there's no kids. I saw what happens when those, some were faithful, but some did, just were coming around. They just kept coming because, well, i got to go to church today. How do you know that? Because the day that the pastor took the church, a third of them left. Well, God's saying, captivity, that bit of adver adversity that's not coming again next time it'll be cut off for good I hope that we do what Nineveh did the first time I hope we do what so many times people have done throughout the Bible get right with God and God's saying a great revival but those that are in the way God will take care of his own he knows those that trusted him 
He'll preserve them. He'll take care of them. But he's saying those that don't put their trust in the Lord, they're going to be taken off the mat because God's going to deal, bring vengeance upon his adversaries. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.